And we welcome you to another edition of Dolphins in Depth, brought to you by the Miami Herald. I'm Barry Jackson. Now, Omar Kelly is not with me today. He is out on the streets looking for guards and defensive tackles for the Dolphins. So he's unavailable today. He'll be back later this week. Joining me is our Isaiah Smalls, who's one of our Dolphins writers. He uh, joined our staff from another department the last couple of weeks. Good to have Isaiah with us. Uh, how was your Labor Day out at Dolphins camp today? What uh, what struck you today about the series of conversations we had with with Dolphins players and with Coach McDaniel? Um, it was it was good. Obviously, hearing Mike McDaniel's thoughts on his extension, right? Like that was big to me. Um, obviously, it was my first time hearing you know Tyreek talk to the media today, which always is uh, is an interesting time to say the least, right? So, I mean, it was it was great, you know. Few better ways to spend a Labor Day than you know talking dolphins. So let's let's get into it. Absolutely. What one of the more interesting things today was McDaniel was asked how his contract extension came about. Was it simply done and strictly done at the agent level, or did Stephen Ross approach him? I asked him for kind of a neat moment with this, and he said that Stephen Ross invited him to dinner a couple of weeks ago, and he told him at that point he wanted to give him an extension. McDaniel said he ate all his steak. He was asked if he ate his vegetables. He's not a big vegetable lover. He said he had his vegetables as well. So that's how that came together. But I like the symmetry, Isaiah, of McDaniel and Tua being on the same timelines. Now, both signed through 2028. It's funny because Tyreek Hill said later in the day that he read something on Twitter that every time a Dolphins coach is paid, he's fired within a year. He said we have to get that change with McDaniel. But I like the, the, the fact that both are on the same timeline. I'll tell you what else I like. To me, if this team fails over the next few years, it's likely not going to be because of McDaniel. What I like in my head coach is a specific skill set that will be an asset to your team. And McDaniel has a couple of them. He's proven he can develop quarterbacks, as he's done with Tua. He's proven that he can call plays creatively at the NFL level. He's done that for two years. And obviously, you know, we can point out to games, perhaps the Buffalo game in the snow a couple of years ago, the Kansas City game where they could have run more. They could have had different calls at certain times. But overall, he's a clearly above average play caller. So because of those two things and because of the fact that he can relate to players in this modern era, I think that will make him an effective coach for years to come. And my feeling is if they don't have the postseason success, it's far more likely to be a result of roster shortcomings and mistakes made at the front office level than with McDaniel. Uh, just from being around him for a couple of weeks, Isaiah, what, what have been your impressions of him and whether you think he's the type of coach that can have sustained NFL success? Yeah. So, you know, my first impression of him is like, I didn't realize, you know, you see on the internet how, you know, kind of funny he is and how personable he is with, with the media. Right. And so I didn't necessarily, you know, think about that going in, but you know, when I got there, obviously he's cracking jokes and, you know, he's um, you know, I, he talks a lot too, which is great, you know, to meeting those uh, word counts. Right. But um, I think overall, like, I mean, to your point, I think it's a great situation, right. I think, you know, 90% of the league would love to have a a head coach uh, quarterback pairing like the Dolphins have, right? Two guys that are on the same page that really support one another. And, you know, you got to go back to Tua's comments after he signed that extension, right? Like the very first thing that McDaniel told him was what? I'm trying to get you paid, right? And I'm sure as a, as a young guy, right? Tua's 26, I'm 28, right? To hear somebody that in a leadership position tell you like they just want to get you paid, like that is, you know – mind-boggling to me like that's that and if I was into his position I would be extremely extremely happy right so you can tell that there's a good marriage there and so I think you know outside of that that little pairing like I think beyond that uh, McDaniel's gonna have a lot of success in this league too. yeah I'm with he's you he's a great play caller um he relates to players I think nowadays you know with with players now that are in my age group right I think it's it's a different coaching style right you can't be as hard on guys um as you used to be right and so I think McDaniel is that perfect age right and that perfect and has the perfect ability to relate to these players in a way so agree there was some good news today so on the injury front everybody practiced except for Jalen Ramsey now with Ramsey the last time McDaniel had been asked about it which was about a week ago he said it's nothing he's concerned with or just being cautious with an injury so I know people were concerned they didn't practice today we'll get more information on Wednesday when injury reports have to be released for the first time by NFL teams. At this point, I wouldn't be too concerned simply because McDaniel has downplayed it, has downplayed it. But at the same time, 
you certainly have to keep an eye on it to see if there is anything that has worsened. There will be questions about this, of course, when we next see the Dolphins on Wednesday. As far as other injury developments, Benito Jones is back to practice. So that's encouraging regarding his potential availability for Sunday. Aaron Brewer was back as well. McDaniel did not want to go as far as saying that both will definitely play Sunday against Jacksonville. He said he left his crystal ball home. But if Brewer is able to play through that laceration on his hand, then the question is, do you move Liam Eikenberg back to right guard immediately, or do you stick with Lester Cotton there? That, to me, is going to be one of the more intriguing decisions of week one if Brewer is a go. Uh, how would you lean toward that? If Brewer can play, do you put Liam back at right guard, or do you say, no, no, Lester Cotton, highest graded Dolphins offensive lineman according to Pro Football Focus in preseason. He deserves a chance in week one. Leave Liam on the bench in week one. How would you play it, Isaiah? Honestly, you, you got to throw Liam in there. Um, to, to me, because he's been very vocal in the past about not liking to play center, right? And so if you're having a player in a position that he doesn't like to play for a sustained amount of time, it's only going to be a bad thing. Like he mentally, he's going to get pissed off because it's like, why I should be playing there. Um, and so I, I, I personally, I'm putting him back to the original spot because, you know, if, if, if Brewer is available to go, why keep a guy in a position that he doesn't like to play? Simply yeah. In that. fairness to, to Liam, he's been a good soldier. He's he of says course. he's willing to play center. He hasn't complained about it. But the way he's phrased it is that he thinks his best position is right guard. He thinks he's a right guard long term. But he has said that he's willing to do it, and he's never complained publicly about it. I don't think he's complained privately either. So I'm with you in the sense that I would go back to Liam. But to me, it's not a no-brainer. If Brewer plays on Sunday, I would give thought to starting Lester Cotton just because he's taken – so many reps there. He's taken all the first team reps there the last couple of weeks. So I think a case could be made to go with Cotton on Sunday. Bring Liam off the bench, then open up the competition in week, probably week three, because there isn't going to be a lot of practice heading into the Buffalo game on nice. a short week next Thursday night. So to me, you're either committing to Lester Cotton for the first two games of the season, or you're going with Liam Eikenberg the first two weeks of the season. And that's assuming Brewer plays on on Sunday, which is no sure thing. Now, on the receiver front, Jalen Waddle was out of the red non-contact practice jersey today. So whatever lower body issue has been bothering him for a couple of weeks, he appears to have moved past. So that's encouraging. Tyreek Hill, who's been battling a finger injury. Of course, he denied today that there was any injury. He said he was just resting the last couple of weeks. But Tyreek likes to kid with us and troll us. So Tyreek was back practicing. The expectation is that both will play this week. Uh, so that's encouraging news. Tyreek's presser today, Isaiah, I wanted to touch on that. There were a couple of amusing things said, as usual. He was yeah. asked about the receiver yeah. room, and he said it's nice to have some bleeping size in there. Of course, he didn't say bleeping. He said something else. But before they acquired Grant Dubose off waivers from Green Bay, the tallest receiver on the active roster was a 5'10". So with Dubose, they have a 6'2 guy. They added Robbie Chosen, who's a 6'3 guy. I know the topic of receivers and size intrigues you. Tell me your thought on having the Smurf-like receiver room. Obviously, <laughs> it's a highly skilled room. They've got two of the best in the league, but it is mostly a small room. Of course. I mean, I think personally, um, to Tyreek's point, I don't think necessarily size matters as much. If, you can, if you're a baller, you're on a ball, right? And Tyreek and Waddle are perfect examples of that, like two guys that are under uh, six foot, right? And so personally, like, I, you know, it's it's a preference thing, right? I, I know a lot of coaches love the big, strong receiver, right? And that has its has its merits, right? But if you have someone like Tyreek Hill who can go up and meet at the catch point, right, and is out jumping a lot of these taller receivers, I mean, what, do you, how, what are you going to complain about, right? And I think the question that I asked him at the end about, you know, does size really matter at that receiver position? Story coming soon because I'm gonna I need to dive in. Um, before the Dubose and chosen signing, I believe the average height of the receiver room was five nine and a quarter, right? Which to me is like wow, right? Um, and I believe it is one of the smallest in the NFL, right? If not the smallest. But uh, you know, to to Tyreek's point, if you can ball, you can ball. I mean, he said it himself. Like he doesn't have the biggest hands. Obviously, he's not the tallest guy but he's a football player, right? And I think that more than anything matters. If you can ball, you can ball. I'm, I'm with you. Now with Waddle, interesting comment today made by Tyreek. He was asked for a prediction on what Jalen will be this year. Can tell you his answer. He said all pro this year. He's taken his game to another level in the classroom. He's taking it more seriously. He's moved to the back of the classroom with me and River Craycraft. He's asking more questions, which is great. 
Uh, this is a Tyree quote. He's eager to get better. He's done a great job taking advice from Coach Welker. So with Tyreek, you never know if he's serious. You never know if he's kidding. You know he loves Jalen Waddle. They're very close. To me, it'd be very difficult for Jalen Waddle to be an all pro just because there aren't enough balls to go around. It's got nothing to do with Jalen Waddle's ability. He's one of the most talented receivers in the league. We know he works at it. He's got all the attributes you need. But if he's a number two receiver here, it's just difficult to envision him having the stats that you need to be an all pro receiver. A couple other quick things from Tyreek today. He was asked about this team. I found it interesting. He says this is the best team we've had since I've been here. He says it's a great time to be alive of Tua. He said Tua's done a great job, quote, over communicating exactly what he wants as far as details on routes. Mike McDaniel's given him the keys to the car. That gives all of us the ability to play free and be ourselves and be creative in our routes. So to me, I don't agree with him saying this is the best Miami Dolphins team he's had. As Omar and I have talked about last week, Isaiah, I think they're clearly worse at most positions, except for tight end, where they're clearly better with Johnny Smith. To me, they're worse than the defensive line. Uh, not any better at cornerback, certainly not any better uh, at receiver without Beckham. That changes once Odell is back. Their offensive line is worse without Connor Williams and Rob Hunt. So I don't agree with him with Tyreek. This is the best Miami Dolphins team he's been on. Uh, what did you make of his comments today about – uh, Tua and communication and given the keys to this offense and your thoughts overall on what this offense is capable of after finishing atop the league last year in passing yardage. So on the Tua comments, uh, I think this is, you know, he's echoing what we've heard, you know, from day one, right? Like once Tua got that, that paycheck and he was very sure that he is going to be the quarterback of the future, a different side came out. Um, he's joking with the media, right? He's, He's, um, you know, smile. He has a huge smile on his face. Not to say he didn't have one before, but you know, if someone's paying me two hundred plus million dollars. I'm gonna be smiling from ear to ear, right? And so he's. You could tell that, you know, from everyone who's who's talked about Tua, like he's a lot more communicative, which is good, right? You want your quarterback to be the one of the loudest person people, if not the loudest person in the room, right? Because there's nothing wrong with communication, right? If you want your guy to run a route a little bit differently, then you should go tell him that, right? And I think now he has the confidence to do that. And, you know, I, I found it funny that Tyreek said, like, at some point, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm even telling him, like, yo, shut up. But that's what you want. You want your quarterback to be over communicative. Um, on the topic of whether or not this is the best Dolphins team since he's been here, um, I mean, I think more so that's a, a message he's putting out there to galvanize his team, right? Um, because you're right, they've lost some some uh, depth at the uh, at the offensive line. The D line isn't as good as it could have been. But I think one of the things that they replaced those people with is they have bigger names, right? I think they have bigger names this year than they had last year. Obviously, o OBJ is probably the most recognizable face in football right now. Um, you have a Cal Calais Campbell, right? Jordan Poyer, like these are guys that are veterans, right? Who have been in the league, have earned their stripes, as McDaniel said earlier. Um, and have the respect of not just the teammates, but the NFL at large. And I think, you know, this is Tyreek saying like, hey, guys, like, I still think we're talented. I still think we can do it. And obviously, that's the number one player in the NFL, right? So if he's telling you guys that like, hey, we can do it, that means something, right? And I think, you know, whether um, – I, I think whether or not they – if this is the most talented team, like, I, I guess, you know, you can make an argument for either way. I, I lean more towards maybe not – but I think that they have the more, more names, right? And I think the names are expected to do something, right? Obviously, when you add a Jordan Poyer, OBJ, Clayus Campbell, like people are expecting more of this team, regardless of the ages, right? And I think, you know, we'll see where they're at week one. Yeah. Yeah. On the age front, I'm not bothered by the fact that they're the oldest team in the league statistically because yeah, that number is skewed by Tyreek, who's still the top of his game. It's skewed by Calais Campbell, who's a freak of nature, 37, still a productive starter. And it's skewed a little bit by Jordan Poyer, who we still expect to be a good player this year. Of the mm -hmm. things you just said, I want to mention the fact that Tua seems very much at ease, joking with us more than ever before. I don't know if it's just the confidence of now having two good years behind him, being healthy last year, the contract extens extension, but there's something that's changed with Tua with us, changed a little bit last year where he became more relaxed and at ease with us, even more so this year. To me, it's been very interesting to see how laid back, jovial, congenial, joking with us, there's a change in him. 
And mm -hmm. I think he's finally at a place in his life where he knows he has made it as a pro. He has proven doubters wrong. He's at the top of his career. Obviously, he knows more than anybody he needs to win playoff games. He said, what we need to win the games that matter. But I think he's just in a very good place mentally, and that's uh, it, it's a good thing. Now, of course, NFL fortune can change quickly. And on Sunday, he's going to see a couple of edge rushers who had double-digit sack numbers last year uh, with Josh Allen with 17 and a half sacks. Uh, and then uh, he faces another edge rusher who had 10 sacks last year uh, for the Jaguars. Uh, so to me, they're offensive. I was speaking of, of Trayvon Walker's name left mm -hmm. me for a second. So Trayvon Walker, the Jaguars, 10 sacks last year. Josh Hines Allen had 17 and a half. So things can change quickly in this league. He mm -hmm. needs protection from his revamped interior offensive line on Sunday. To me, yeah. this is a, a little bit of a frightening game in this regard. Even though the Dolphins enter week one as favorites, Jacksonville is a playoff caliber team, even though they missed Last year, they obviously made it a couple of years ago, won that playoff game against Chargers in which L.A. gave up a big lead. You know that Trevor Lawrence, even though he's underperformed so far as a pro, you know he's really good. And you know that Jacksonville has a type of edge rushers that could give Miami's offensive line problems. So to me, I have a small degree of confidence they're going to win Sunday. I don't have a great degree of confidence. Your early read on this game would be what, Isaiah? I mean, I think you you, you got to go in and, and take care of business. I I I'd see them winning this game. Um, I think you're right. I think you know they have good they have good edge rushers in Walker and Hines Allen. You know, Trevor Lawrence is still one of those guys, and you know, Tua and, and Trevor are going to be linked throughout you know their entire career. But I think this is a, a game for Tua to kind of prove his worth. Like, look, like I am that guy, right? And so I, I I'm looking for him to have a big game because. You know, like I said, those two guys are going to be forever linked, right? And for him to go out there, I think the best way for him to prove the doubters, you know, if there's still any doubters out there wrong, is, is to him go out there and, and ball out, right? Have a great game. You know, Tyreek obviously have a monster game. Watt will have a, a good game or monster game as well. And to be honest, I'm not as worried. Like I was, I literally went through the schedule the other day and went, win, win, you know, trying to figure out where they're going to be. And, you know, I had, I picked that one as a game. That they're gonna win, right? And so I'm, I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay with that. You know, of course they have some injuries. They're banged up a little bit. But what team isn't banged up? You know, I think you, you, you gotta go with what you got. And so I think this is a good team. I am a little bit worried that the secondary hasn't practiced altogether um, once. And you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Jalen out there with the rest of the guys, right? It's been. It seemed like they've been trading out who's not practicing every single practice. But um, you know, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to it though. I think it's gonna be a good game. It's gonna be a good matchup. You know, I think both teams have a lot to prove, but I think the Dolphins are going to have the edge for sure. Well, if they don't win Sunday, my goodness, then you're looking at a Buffalo team that's had their number for the last four years and then that's the potential of an 0 2 star. I don't even want to go there. I don't exactly. even want to go there. Exactly. It's frightening to think about that than having to go into Seattle. You know, you need a strong start, which they've had both exactly. years under McDaniel because that schedule down the stretch is so difficult. You at can't. Houston, home to San Francisco. At Cleveland, you get the Jets twice over the last five weeks of the season. You have to have a good start, and that's why there's no must-wins in September, mm -hmm. but they need to emerge from these two games with at least one win and likely two. Uh, I wanted to touch on captains. I know this is a topic that doesn't particularly mean a lot once the season starts, but there is some symbolism in being voted a captain by your teammate. It says something about you. It's something players take pride in. Dolphins captains, as voted by players, were named today. They are Tua, Jalen Ramsey, Tyree Kill, David Long, Alec Ingold, Teron Armstead, Zach Sealer, and Calais Campbell. It's a very good group filled with pro bowlers. I want to get your thoughts on this in a minute, Isaiah. But first, we have some sound from David Long talking today about how meaningful it is for him to be named a captain. Take a listen. When this uh, player voted... Um, and it means a lot when you're in here training with these guys. You know, off season, you know, I've been here uh, going to my second year, um, and we all know the grind, especially with the heat out here. Uh, we know it's tough, and um, it means a lot to sit uh, sit with these guys and train with these guys and know they see the, the effort I put in. Um, but besides that, it's just more responsibility that I already you know put on myself. Um, you know that I have to carry. Um, you know, I just can't I can't be getting on everybody else if I don't have myself together. Um, so, you know, uh, just being me, um, you know, that's how it is. Coach McDaniel said you were playing it cool when they told you you were a good captain. Did you yeah. have a moment where you didn't play it cool and maybe call a family member? And yeah, for, for sure. I, the first person I called was my mom. 
um, cause we we have our little talks, you know, um, you know when it's you no know, stuff is going bad and when stuff is going good. Uh, so she knows, you know, the, um, you know what, what it means to me. Um, and she was excited, and you know, she she felt like, you know, uh, I could have been had any other year. I was in the league, and you know, she just felt like, you know, it was a uh, run the time, and you know, everything was just coming together. And uh, you know, we we talked about it for a while. When was the last time you were a captain at any level? Uh, college. Uh, that was the last time. Um, yeah, and then in Tennessee, um, you know, uh, as far as the mic and having the green dot, that's the role itself. Um, no, but not, no, no captain until, until here while in the league. You know, I'm happy for David Long. You can see how meaningful this is to him. And if you talk to teammates last year, everybody talks about what a dog, that's D-A-W-G, in the most complimentary sense of the word, that he is, how when he hits you, everyone feels it. He's a high effort player. He's a good guy. He's a leader. I think when he talks, people listen. So I feel happy for him. The only mild surprise today was neither one of the safeties was voted a captain. Jordan Poyer obviously has respect from everybody in the league, including all of his teammates. Javon Holland is respected by teammates. He's not a captain this year. So I thought that was interesting, but you can't have an unlimited number. What struck you about this list of captains, Isaiah? So I really liked the Calais Campbell pick. Obviously, he's a guy that has come in and has been a huge mentor to everybody on that Z line, right? Um, even outside of it, right? Like, you know, uh, Long talked about, uh, you know, what he's been for somebody like a Chop Robinson, right? And so to me, you know, that just shows, you know, age is nothing but a number, right? Because all the guys, you know, I think Jalen talked about it last week, how Jalen Phillips, excuse me, talked about how, you know, he doesn't look like an old man out there. And so I think that says something, right? You can back up what you're saying. And so I'm sure Calais has been a huge um, resource for everybody on that team, on that defense specifically. And, you know, Zach Sealy, you got to be happy for that guy, you, you know, knowing his journey and how long he's been, you know, grinding. And, you know, I know him and Christian Wilkins were really good friends. And so, you know, it's a business at the end of the day, right? And so to see your friend go on, I'm sure it wasn't the easiest thing to deal with, but I think, he talked, you know, a couple of weeks ago about having to step up and be a leader, right? And, you know, him being voted a captain, I think, shows that he's grown in that regard. I mean, this man is talking about he's getting there 615, 630 every single day. That's not normal. Uh, you know, the, the average guy is not doing that, right? And so just to just to see that, you know, that effort, that work has been rewarded, you know, gotta be, you got to be happy for him. And, you know, I too was kind of, you know, scratching my head a little bit that, you know, there's no Javon or no Jordan, but, I, you, you know, what are you going to do? Like, I, I think Calais, you know, is somebody that's been healthy throughout um, training camp. You know, Zach Sealer, another guy has been healthy throughout training camp. And I think that means something to the players, right? If you are out here, you know, balling, you know, day in, day out, especially if you're a little bit older player like Calais, like, you know, you reward that sort of effort, right? And so to me, um, it's a good list. Uh, definitely happy to see for, for everyone that was named the captain. Um, just looking forward to seeing what, what goes on in the future with them. And to me, it speaks well of this roster that you could have made a case for 16 guys, including Jalen Phillips, who's coming off injury and has really become a leader. Bradley Chubb, I think the only reason why he's probably not on this list is because he might not come back until October off the knee injury. So you could have made a case for him. I know teammates love Bradley Chubb. He's been a mentor, both he and Phillips, to some of the younger edge players. So I think that speaks very well to the type of character that Chris Greer and Mike McDaniel have brought in. You can question some of their personnel decisions this offseason, as I have, but in terms of the quality of people that they have brought in, high marks for Chris Greer and Mike McDaniel for the locker room that they've created, you aren't going to find more upstanding citizens to look up to than the Toronto Armsteads the Raheem Mostert's, the Alec Ingold's. I could go on and on in this locker room. So I think that's one real positive with this roster. And of course, two is liked by everybody on the team, uh, and as is Tyreek. Now, a couple of interesting uh, groupings of positions I want to go over with you. Some news this week. Receiver is very interesting. I asked McDaniel about this today because you're going into Sunday with only three clear-cut players who are going to be playing with Hill, Waddle, Braxton Berrios. After that, you're in a unique position that you seldom see where you could either go with the fourth and fifth receivers on your 53, who are Malik Washington and Grant DuBose, who just arrived here from Green Bay last mm -hmm. Thursday. Neither has played an NFL snap. Obviously, Malik Washington's a rookie. DuBose was on the practice squad for the Packers all last year. So you can go with one or both of them on Sundays, your fourth and fifth receivers, or you could do something that I've been pushing on this show for weeks. You could elevate 
couple of your veteran receivers on the practice squad, one being Robbie Chosen, who just arrived again late last week after being cut by the 49ers, obviously played for the Dolphins last year, or D. Eskridge, who's played in 24 games for Seattle, 17 career catches. I asked McDaniel about that today. He said they have interesting options. They're going to consider all of them this week. I would say Danny Crossman will be part of that decision. Uh, Dubose has value on special teams for sure. Uh, he said he can play Gunner if they need him in that role. So that's going to be an interesting decision. Who is fourth and fifth? And even if they bring five receivers to the game on Sunday, Isaiah, you still might see receiver snaps go to Ashan, who has told me he's very comfortable in that role. He lined up at receiver some last year. He's lined up there a lot in practice, he confirmed to us over the last several days. So I think you'll see him take a lot of those snaps. To you, what's the best lineup you can field uh, like on third and eight on Sunday? Would you go with – Barrios, would you go with two tight end sets with John New and Durham? Would you go with A-Shan slotted out? What's the most dangerous look knowing they have no Odell and no Craig Kraft either? Yeah, so to me, I'm going back to something that I noticed in the game too. Um, John New Smith, I think that's a name that hasn't been talked about enough, right? Like they really like this kid. They have really, you know, built packages for him. As you know, McDaniel uh, said, or I, I think you know, McDaniel didn't say that today. Alec Ingold talked about that today, right? Um, but in the past, McDaniel has talked about what uh, John who brings to the team. So I'm I'm more so interested in seeing how they use him, right? You know, when I talked to him after the uh, Commanders game, I was like, "Look, man, you've lined up in every single position, but the traditional tight end position, right?" So like, what you know, and he was just saying like, "Hey, I'm just thrilled to be here. You know, I love this offense, et cetera, et cetera." And, you know, you see the way that they're moving him around the field. I think more than, you know, after after burials, I think that's going to be like the wide receiver forward. Like to me, I mean, like you can try to elevate a Malik Washington. Haven't really seen anything that warrants that. I think you might. I Personally, I, I, I like having um, chosen there because he's been in the offense before. Right. He's somebody yeah. that has. Uh, reps in this offense. So I think that's the guy, but then also it's John U. Smith, right? He's not a traditional tight end by any stretch of the imagination. We saw him take a reverse um, in that game too. So I'm more so looking at him and seeing what he's going to do. And it's funny enough because I've, you know, I've, I've said this earlier, like, you know, I've done a few fantasy drafts over the past couple of days, right? And nobody seems to be high on John U. Smith for whatever reason. The I know that there's oh, this. That I, me. He's going to be a big part of this offense. As you exactly. Said. Exactly. But for whatever reason, there's this idea that, you know, McDaniel offense doesn't really cater to tight ends. And in the past, that might have been true. Right. But we've seen there's actual tape of John New lining up in a bunch of positions in this office and not only lining up in those positions, getting the ball in those positions. Right. And so for yeah, me, to me, John New somebody. Smith is the one reason why they can be better offensively than they exactly. were a year ago. They're not as exactly. good at center. They're not as good at right guard. But John New will allow them to possibly be better this year. Uh that's that's the offensive concern, I guess, is will they just have enough bodies on some yeah. besides the interior offensive line? I agree with you on Chosen. I would go with him. My prediction for Sunday, purely a prediction, is that mm -hmm. Chosen and Dubose are the active receivers. I think Malik Washington will be down on Sunday. Again, this is not inside information. This is just me projecting. I base this opinion on the fact that, as you said, Isaiah, Chosen familiar with the offense. He gives him a deep threat. If they need to go four wides, an experienced player who knows the system, Dubose, I think, is special teams value and his size is an asset. So I would give them a little bit of the nod over Malik Washington and over Ezukama, who's still injured, he's on the practice squad, and over D. Eskridge, who is a former Seattle player on the practice squad. So if five are active, my guess is four and five are Dubose and Robbie Chosen. Now, defensively, I want to ask you about their secondary. Uh, obviously, no Camp Smith for at least four weeks. So Ethan Bonner will be one of your top four corners, assuming he holds off Storm Duck, which I'm sure will be the case. So it's going to be Kohu as your number three and your nickel. It's going to be Bonner as your number four. Now, corners often play every snap. So it's quite conceivable that we might not see Ethan Bonner at all on Sunday. But there's a possibility we can because even though McDaniel has downplayed Jalen Ramsey's injury, we know that something exists or he wouldn't have missed practice for most of the past week and a half. So what's your comfort level with Ethan Bonner at this point if he has to play some snaps on Sunday? I'm not that comfortable. I'm going to be honest with you. Not, really? okay. not, not, not over, not – I mean, obviously Jalen Ramsey is one of those guys, right? I don't I, – I think that, you know, from what I've heard about him, from what 
Um, I've, I've read about him. Like he's going to be a guy that's going to be raring to go, even if he's a little bit banged up. And so that's the type of player that I want out on the edge. I mean, this is nothing against Ethan Bonner specifically, right? I, I think he's a good player. I think he'll be fine. I think, I just think he needs to grow a little bit, but I think I, I want Jalen out there, right? He's a leader on that defense. I want him out there. I want him playing as much as he can physically play. Right. Um, I mean, so if, if Ethan has to go out there for a few snaps, okay. But if I'm Trevor Lawrence, I'm keying in on that, right? Like that's not, so you don't want to, you know, the thing about playing defense in the national football league, right. Is you don't want to have a weak spot that you can consistently attack. Right. And if I'm Trevor Lawrence and I'm lining up and I see Ethan Bonner out there, I'm attacking that. So you don't want to have that sort of hole. And I think, you know, if, if I, if I know anything about Jalen Ramsey, he's going to play on Sunday. And so that's bar none. I want Jalen Ramsey out there. Not that confident on, on, on Bonner. And it's like I said, it's nothing against him specifically. It's more so what, uh, the advantages that that the, the offense will have with him in the game. I want to touch on one concern I have on this roster that's been really concerned for Dolphins teams for years. And Miami's not unique with this, but linebacker pass coverage on tight ends and running backs. And I feel like it's timely this week because on Sunday they're going to see Evan Ingram, who caught 114 passes, led all NFL tight ends last year, 963 receiving yards, four TDs. Then five days later they're going to see Josh Allen, who has killed them when he has targeted linebackers in pass coverage. So to me, this has to be short up. David Long's pass coverage obviously has been a shortcoming. Kansas City attacked him in the playoff game last year successfully. Buffalo attacked him successfully. So I'm curious to see, will Jordan Brooks be effective covering tight ends if he draws the assignment, or will that assignment go to a nickel corner like Kou? And also, will Anthony Weaver figure out how to solve this perpetual problem for the Dolphins? And I know this is not uncommon in the league. Linebackers have trouble keeping up with really good tight ends and running backs, but it's something that the Dolphins have been below average at for years. They have to figure out a solution. So to me, that's going to be one issue uh, on Sunday. I uh, want to touch on a final thing, Isaiah. You did a Chop Robinson story today on MiamiHerald.com. Tell me some of your takeaways on Chop, whether you feel like he's ready for a substantial package. Can he set the edge well enough? Uh, or do you think he's going to be more of a limited role, third down, select package of snaps on Sunday? Yeah, I think he, he's at first it's going to be limited, right? I think he still needs to grow when it comes to setting the edge on the run. You know, the Buccaneers kind of exposed him a little bit. Uh, the commander certainly exposed him a little bit too. Um, and so that's what – and so – but the great thing about Chop, though, is that he has amazing mentors, right? He has a Bradley Chubb in his ear, right? He has a Jalen Phillips in his ear. Right? And these are players that he told me specifically that he looked up to in high school and he tried to model his game after. So to have – uh, those players now in the same locker room with you. He told me it's a bit of a surreal experience, right? But for him, it's it's great because he gets to learn from the very guys he looked up to, right? And so I'm sure they're in his ear and they're they're helping. And you know, Jalen Phillips also had similar issues with setting the edge on the run um, during his rookie year, right? And so I think you know, Chop specifically is going to glean a lot from him. And so I think specifically right now, because of the athleticism, because he can, he, his explosiveness, like he, they will have specific, you know, I think third down packages for him, you know, and the obvious passing downs, right. He's going to be a guy that's going to fly um, towards the, the quarterback and try to make a play there. Um, but outside of that, I think he can, he, he needs to grow a little bit and, and setting the, setting the edge on the run. Right. And I think that will happen over time, right. As his instincts continue to improve because, you know, Jalen Phillips specifically said that he, he believes that, that that Chop is more of a polished prospect than he was at that age, right? And Jalen Phillips right now is, one of, again, one of those guys. So for him to say that, obviously they have a lot of faith in Chop. And, you know, everyone keeps talking about how much of a, a, a veteran he is when it comes to his work ethic, right? And I think that that's, that speaks a lot and that speaks volumes on who he is as a player, right? He's somebody that's going to come in get the work done, listen to his guys. He's, he's told me that he's watching film with Chubb and JP, just trying to figure out where um, he can improve in. And so there is, excuse me, that he can improve in. So I think that's going to pay dividends, uh, you know, down the line. And I think by, by years end that that package that might've been a little bit small at first, it's going to be, it's going to grow. 
Right, right. He certainly has to improve against the run. And snap allocations is the ultimate truth serum. Dolphins coaches can talk up uh, Chop Robinson all they want. We will see on Sunday how much they For trust sure. him by how many downs sure. he plays, whether they play Ogba significantly more than him, whether they play Quentin Bell or even Mo Kamara ahead of him. That will tell us everything. Isaiah, it's been fun. Enjoy doing it with you. Omar will be back on Wednesday. We thank you all for joining us on this edition of Dolphins In Depth. We hope you've had a fun Labor Day. We'll see you later this week. So long, everyone. Peace.